I would like to introduce Dr. Berglund right now to talk about how to understand and evaluate clinical trials. All right, thank you very much. And it is a real pleasure to be here today. So thank you to Josh and the other organizers for inviting me. Um, okay, so I um, am admittedly a medical oncologist. My specialty is neuroendocrine tumors, but I understand that there is sort of a range of different um, people and diseases perhaps represented in the room, so I'll try to keep my comments relatively broad. And I'm not going to be focusing specifically on imaging, I'm really just going to be painting with a broad brush just to give you some basic um, framework to think about clinical trials um, across disease areas. So we'll cover these different areas, I'll talk a little bit about what clinical research is, um, I'll talk about the overall drug development process, I'll talk about how to find out about clinical trials, and also try to give you some thoughts about how to decide if participation is right for you. Um, and we'll talk at the end a little bit about uh, how to interpret data from clinical trials and what I at least perceive to be the highest quality data and things to look for um, around that idea. Um, so what, does it, what do we mean when we talk about what is clinical research? Well, clinical trials are basically trials that involve research involving people. Um, they differ by type of trial and phase of trial, and I'll go into this in a few minutes. But the very important point is that clinical research is very, very regulated, and it all revolves around something called a clinical protocol. And that's why you'll find there's some rigidity associated with participating in clinical trials in terms of when you might, for example, start a drug or when you get your next dose or when the scans are done. And this is important because it requires um, adherence to the protocol, and we as investigators are required to adhere, adhere to the protocol, and that's why there'll be um, a detailed calendar given to patients and detailed instructions. So it's all to make sure that the research is done well, but it does mean that we have a lot less flexibility when it comes to treating patients or even imaging patients on a clinical protocol than when you're doing it as part of just routine clinical practice where it might not be a big deal to miss a dose of drug or to come in a few days late, et cetera. So the flexibility, we try to build it into the clinical protocols, but it's much less flexible than you might see just during the context of your regular care. Um, now, clinical research is, a long, is actually the final step in a long clinical process. Now again, whether it's developing a new imaging modality or it's developing a new drug, there's a lot that happens before this ever actually reaches um, treating patients or imaging patients. Um, it's the way we actually translate improvements in basic research to the clinic. Um, and it does ultimately lead to advances in clinical care and, of, of patients. And so really the theme to remember is that today's treatments are based on the results of previous clinical trials. It's how we move the ball forward and it's what re what's required for the regulatory agencies like the F FDA to actually approve drugs. So now, one of the points I'll make, this happens to be data related to cancer. I don't know the data specifically for Alzheimer's, which I know is another um, area of interest at this meeting. But I will say it's important to note that in adult oncology, a tiny fraction of patients actually participates in clinical trials. And there's a lot of barriers that are out there, just even if it's just physically able for you to do that based on the location of the trials. But it is important to note, I think in pediatrics we do quite a bit better where a larger proportion of children participate in trials, but in the adult cancer world it's actually the, the minority of patients who ultimately um, participates in trials. But again, the barriers are widespread um, and on, at the level of just having trials available and designed and open for patients, but also for patients deciding whether it's a good fit, and we'll talk about that at the end. So types of trials, there's a whole range of them. I mean, the obvious ones we think about are treatment trials where you have a disease and you're getting an, a, a new therapy, experimental therapy. There are also trials that look at preventing something, uh, preventing the disease itself, for example, in a high-risk population. There are trials focused on detection or screening. So for example, a new imaging modality might be studied in a clinical trial. Um, studies of new diagnostics and studies looking at quality of life or supportive care, controlling symptoms, um, the role of diet and exercise in disease, um, 
And then you'll find, if you're looking on the internet on clinicaltrials.gov, which is a very useful resource, you'll also, also find a number of registry trials. Those are actually just tracking patients and how, their outcome over time, but not, not intervening in any particular way. Uh-oh. Okay. Um, so using cancer as an example, I want to show you some data. This is from 2015, and at that point there were almost 600 cancer drugs in late stage development, so in clinical trials. Um, but importantly, the time it actually took from patent filing to FDA approval, um, on average at that time was close to 10 years, although as fast as four years. Um, and that particular year, there were 15 drugs that were approved. So um, this is sort of the state of the art, although I'm going to show you some information in a minute that suggests that this, might, this process might be changing and might be improving. Um, in terms of the speed, but it's sort of by necessity a kind of relatively slow process because there are these very important steps that are involved in taking a drug from an idea to actually getting it FDA approved. And, you know, early on you might have, for example, you're doing uh, what are called preclinical studies where you're trying to determine if this drug is a, is a good drug, if it has good bioavailability, if you take it as a pill, um, you know, some very basic safety studies that are done. Um, but ultimately, um, you apply to this investigational new drug application that says that you want to now study this in humans. There's generally a phase one study, which is usually very small, just looking at safety and trying to get a handle on how the drug is metabolized in patients. Um, then typically, once you think you have a general idea of the dosing of the drug, you'll take it into another study called phase two, which looks at the basic efficacy of it and also looks at toxicity. Um, phase three trials are generally much larger, and those are where you're actually comparing your drug to whatever's considered to be the standard of care. Um, and then ultimately, after that, uh, that trial has read out, that's where you have the opportunity to potentially have it be FDA approved. But this process from start to finish can take 10 years from getting it from the lab through the completion of a phase three study. Sometimes you'll see additional studies that are done after the drug's already FDA approved. Um, now, just this is sort of complicated, but I want to just reiterate that this has historically been the way these studies have been done. Phase one trials can be as small as 20 patients, and usually you're studying different dose levels. Um, and you're really just trying to sort out mostly is this safe and how can we give this drug? How should the drug be given? Phase two trials are usually a bit bigger. Sometimes they're randomized, meaning you're comparing it to a standard of care. And it's try usually trying to see whether your drug has activity in a specific disease. And then phase three, again, are much larger. They're really powered to show statistically significant improvements relative to the standard of care. And as I said, phase four are done after the drug's approved. Um, looking at it a little bit differently in terms of the time frame for how long these take, again, the smaller studies might take a year or two years to complete, with the larger studies sometimes taking four to five years to complete. Now, obviously, to some extent, this depends on how fast um, enrollment happens to these trials, uh, but this is a basic idea. Um, the other point I would make is that the phase one studies are often done just at one or two centers. You know, this is a small number of patients. We have a number of these that might just be only done at our institution or just at a few institutions. Whereas a phase three study might be done at hundreds of institutions um, in the United States or globally. So oftentimes they're global studies, so centers around the world. Um, so the goals of the study vary and they're highly regulated at every step along the way. Um, I will just mention something recently that changed, and I'm going to use this example. This is a, from an immunotherapy trial that was done in cancer, but it was very, very interesting because it actually, I think, provides some hope that this whole process might be evolving a little bit. Um, this was a study that used an immunotherapy drug, member of this checkpoint family of, of um, inhibitors, and they began the trial in 2011. It was a first-in-human trial. Um, but there was this very rapid expansion of various cohorts that this trial had. And ultimately, and this was very unique and very unlike the previous pattern of drug development I showed you. But I'm showing this because it is so unique. In the end, there were 1,200 patients enrolled in the initial study because the trial was modified and expanded and many different cohorts were added. 
very unusual, very successful though, because they were able to show such significant um, efficacy in some of these subgroups compared to what was available. Um, it wasn't in a randomized trial necessarily, but because the data were so um, strong and powerful that they were able to get accelerated FDA approval in three years from the beginning of the trial. And there were some, and that happened to be in melanoma, where they ultimately had enrolled 173 patients in this study. So um, I'll mention this is an editorial in the New England Journal of Medicine, which is one of our premier journals, by, by um, a number of uh, people at the FDA talking about this idea, which they call a seamless drug development program, also known as um, seamless expansion cohort. And they mention that some other companies are following suit and trying to design these um, first in human studies that have these cohorts that expand out of it. But they cautioned um, the reader that you have to be very careful about this because the trials still need to be done well. And you still need to be collecting the information that the FDA is ultimately going to be needing. And it's probably only going to be applicable for certain types of diseases where you could do this sort of drug development. Um, so a number of challenges, but I will say as a patient or as, and certainly as a provider taking care of patients, it's a very interesting idea to think that there might be faster ways that we can safely get these drugs to become available for general populations. So a new strategy evolving, but I think exciting that there might be some movement in terms of the drug development um, schema that we've traditionally followed. So um, what happens now, so let's say you have a positive study, there's definitely activity, you believe that you um, have a drug that is efficacious and you submit to the FDA, there can also be a delay on that end because the FDA now has to go through all of this data. And um, I think, uh, you know, we're, those of you in the room who may be familiar with the neuroendocrine world know that there have been some delays specifically with PRT, the PRT application, and uh, we're still waiting for the FDA review of that or, or response to that. But typically, it's on the order of eight to nine months um, be, from the time of submitting the packet to actually getting the response from the FDA about whether the drug's approved. Um, so I think the FDA is trying to resp be responsive. They recognize this need to try to get drugs available in a, in a more generalized fashion to patients, not just in clinical trials but they're also charged with making sure it's done safely. And in doing so, they need to go back and make sure that the trials were done well and that the data that they collected was high quality. And in the end, it's basically to ensure patient safety and balancing that with the need to try to get the drugs available. Um, so biomarkers might be one way to expedite the process and that there are a variety of different markers that could be used to enrich the population. From a PRT perspective, we're looking for somatostatin receptor expression, which um, you can tell from our um, somatostatin scintigraphy or our Dotatox scans, for example. But in some cases, it's a mutation-based biomarker that some studies have done, or it might be um, some marker on the tissue. Some of the immunotherapy studies, for example, have required certain biomarkers to be present. And that can be a way to really enrich your patient population for those who are most likely to respond, but only if you've chosen the right biomarker, and, and that's been a challenge for many of our drugs. Um, so I, I mentioned at the beginning that as investigators, we're bound to follow the instructions in the protocol, and I want to just explain what the protocol is. It's usually a roughly 100-page document that will include the background, what's, what's the standard, what's the landscape for this disease, why is this drug of interest, what's known about this drug. Um, What's the eligibility? What is the patient group we're studying? And I'll talk about this more in a minute, but this is very, very important um, for trying to make the, the study population uniform so you can get high quality information from it. Um, what's the precise treatment plan? As I mentioned, if it's a drug, you know, when is it given? How is it given? How often it is given? When are the scans done? Um, how long is a patient gonna be treated with that, that therapy? Um, and then importantly, there's a whole section on the statistical plan, which really pushes the researcher to explain why do you have the number of patients you have in the study, what are you trying to learn from the study, what is your statistical plan, and are you likely to get an answer from this study? 
Um, and then monitoring. How are we going to make sure that this is all done correctly, that it's done safely? And um, there is a procedure in place, not only if you're doing a study at your own institution, but also if it's a multiple center institution, how do you communicate? How do investigators that are maybe all over the United States or all over the world going to be connected during the study while it was going on? And how are we going to make sure it's done safely? Um, so eligibility, this is probably the biggest take home, to take, take home from my talk, as, certainly as a patient or an advocate of a patient, is this is really the, the bread and butter of trials because you have to look carefully at the eligibility. What, what disease, what stage, is it newly diagnosed, is it someone with advanced disease, is it someone who doesn't have the disease yet but is at very high risk for developing the disease. Um, some studies specify whether disease is stable or progressi progressing when you go on therapy. Sometimes prior therapy matters. Um, current medications sometimes can matter. So that's especially true for a lot of the pills that we give patients where there can be drug-drug interactions. Um, is there a biomarker required for this patient to be eligible? And are other medical problems a factor? And this comes up all the time, and I'll give you an example. For immunotherapy, one of the side effects would be reactivation or, or causing autoimmune events. So if a patient has a known active autoimmune disease, they might not be eligible for an, for an immunotherapy, just as an example. Um, so what procedures are in place to protect patients? Well, I would say number one is informed consent. Um, and this is the way you as a patient learn about risks and benefits. Can I just see hands raised for who's ever seen an informed consent or signed an informed consent? Okay, so a, a good portion has. So if you've seen these, they're very long and they can be in some cases up to 25 page long documents, um, but they are designed to try to explain to you what is known about the drug, why we are doing this, what procedures are gonna be entailed and what are the potential risks. Um, in addition, I want you to know that on the back end, there's a lot going on at the institution or the site that you're doing this trial at. There is a scientific review, and the scientific review is asking the question of, does this trial make sense? And are you going to be able to get an answer from this trial based on what you've outlined in your, in your protocol? Um, and then there's something called an institutional review board. And the Institutional Review, Review Board, also known as the IRB, is to make sure that the, page, the study is conducting the research appropriately and really is looking out to make sure that patients are informed. So um, we are highly regulated at our institution by both of these panels and um, in an, on an ongoing basis. It's to get prior to getting your study open, but then periodically while the study is open. Um, and as I said, the IRB monitors safety. In addition, there are data and safety monitoring boards uh, potentially uh, for the study as a whole. And they will even have people come into the various study sites and review the records and make sure that the research is being done properly. And then there's required reporting to federal agencies. So how do you find out about clinical trials? And I know this is often a challenge. And I will say that um, for cancer, one strategy is to just ask your doctor, and that may or may not be effective depending on where you are and your doctor's knowledge about your specific disease. If you have a cancer center in your area or have access to a cancer center, they may have a website that's up to date, hopefully, with trials. Um, many disease-specific foundations are now starting to build in um, information about clinical trials, so that's a good way. Um, as it happens for cancer, the National Cancer Institute actually has resources for patients to try to match them with clinical trials. And they actually have a very nice website, and clinicaltrials.gov, which allows you to put in your disease. You can even put in your area, your, um, your zip code, and you can say how far you'd be willing to travel, and you can actually filter that way so you can find clinical trials for your disease based on distance from your location. Um, there are some challenges. These aren't perfect systems. Um, in the case of certain diseases, there might be multiple names for the diseases, and depending on how they coded it in this website, it may or may not pull up your disease, but it's generally a good place to start. Um, and I just would mention for Alzheimer's, there's actually something very similar. Um, there's the National Institute for Aging also has a phone number and a website you can email. So there's, I think, similar resources available for patients um, looking for trials related to Alzheimer's. Um, 
So things to think about if you're considering enrolling in a trial. I would say, you know, you should ask the question of why is the trial being done? What kinds of tests and treatments are involved? It could be as simple as a one-time imaging, imaging test or a one-time research biopsy, or it could be something that could be two years of therapy coming in every other week. And so understanding what's required is very important. Um, thinking about the benefits, as I said, you know, very early stage studies like phase one studies, oftentimes if you're in one of the first cohorts, it's really looking to try to figure out if this drug is safe and what the proper dose is. That doesn't mean that there is no chance of benefit. We, we certainly always are doing these trials hoping there might be a chance of benefit, but early on we're often trying to sort out the proper dosing and the proper safety, the safety of the drug. Um, some, some trials, as you well know, are placebo controlled, where you might be randomized and some patients might be getting placebo. That's an important thing to integrate into your decision making. It's very important in terms of understanding if the drug really is safe and if it's effective and what its side effects are, but at the same time, that's a factor that patients will often consider in deciding if they want to enroll on a trial. Um, how will it affect my daily life and am I gonna to have to travel long distance? This gets to the barriers to trials that oftentimes um, it might be great to be able to enroll in a trial, but it may physically be difficult depending on where the trial is located and balancing that depending on what your willingness to do the trial versus the accessibility is important. And then the bottom one is will I have to pay? And paying means sometimes it's time. You know, maybe you're working and you have a job or it's childcare or it's transportation or other issues related to um, uh, standard care, which um, for many clinical trials, care that's considered routine, say CT scanning every two or three months, is usually the patient's insurance is billed. And so if you have a copay, you may still have that even if you're on the clinical trial. Um, usually any tests that are specific to the research part of the study that are not considered standard of care will be covered by the, um, the sponsor of the trial. Um, so finally, I'd like to finish up and just mention um, information about interpreting data from clinical trials. Um, I would say that, you know, ultimately, as investigators, when we're looking at the data, we're really looking for all of these elements. And in an ideal world, you're looking at data that's been published in a respectable um, journal that is peer reviewed, meaning that other experts have had a chance to look at all of the data, review the manuscript, make comments, get clarification from the researchers, and ultimately have it published. And ultimately, that consists of all of these elements. Again, the background, the rationale, what was done, who was enrolled, um, all of the safety results, efficacy, and then importantly, a discussion and interpretation of the limitations of the study and sort of what it adds to the landscape, the treatment landscape. Um, I would say, again, as you are reading about results, and um, I'll give you a great example. It could be an abstract at a meeting, you know, a, a meeting like this, or it could be something that you read on somebody's website or a blog, or there's a press release. One of the most important questions to ask is, does it apply to you? And I'm just gonna run through a few disease groups to give you some ideas. In neuroendocrine, some studies are, are for untreated patients, some are for previously treated. Some are specifically for carcinoid or pancreas neuroendocrine or lung nets but not the other, the other groups. Um, some are for tumors that are well differentiated, others are for very poorly differentiated. Those are really different disease groups. So you have to be careful you're looking at results that resonate with you in terms of what you have. Um, some are for tumors that make hormones, those are called functional tumors, others are for the non-functional tumors. Some require progression at entry, some don't, and some allow somatostatin analogs and others don't. So these are just some of the things to think about in terms of eligibility. Moving on to prostate cancer, another group that I know that is represented at this meeting. Um, some are for patients at risk for prostate cancer but haven't actually developed prostate cancer. Untreated or previously treated, local disease versus metastatic disease, hormone sensitive versus hormone refractory or castrate resistant. Um, there's a new subtype of prostate cancer out there now, a neuroendocrine subtypes, and there are now trials popping up specifically for that subtype of prostate cancer. So again, making sure you're looking at a trial for the right histologic type. And then for thyroid cancer, same thing, 
different types of thyroid cancer. Some studies are gonna allow them to be bundled. Some are gonna specifically be for anaplastic thyroid or specifically for well-differentiated thi thyroid. And these trials may or may not allow some of these more uncommon variants. So again, just understanding who is the patient population under study and does that apply to you? And then finally for Alzheimer's, just looking over the trials that are posted on um, nci.gov, you know, really the trials tend to be separated into patients who are um, potentially high risk for developing Alzheimer's versus patients who are in average risk. Um, people who already have the disease or are at risk for developing the disease, um, untreated or previously treated, the severity of the symptoms. Some a lot of the studies are for mild to moderate symptoms. Some are for severe. And then the goal of therapy is it to prevent the disease from occurring or to prevent it from worsening. Um, so finally, to talk about the significance of the result, really asking why was the study done. Some studies will be to control symptoms, some will be to control the disease, some may be to actually shrink the disease, some, some studies may have been done to just stabilize the disease and just sort of putting it in perspective what it's for. Um, importantly, is it a preliminary analysis? And again, when you read things like press releases in the news, that's very, usually very limited information is available in that. So you really need to drill down and get this additional information to try to fully understand the, the significance of the results. Even abstracts, when we submit abstracts, you're only given about 300 words to put your information in there. So it's just the tip of the iceberg in terms of what's available in terms of the, the final manuscript that will come from this. Um, and then ideally, it's from prospective controlled randomized studies. That's considered the gold standard in our field. And um, that's really what tends to move the ball forward. Um, the early studies, you know, again, traditionally the phase one and two studies are, they get you in the ballpark, they tell you if your drug is safe and there's some evidence of activity, but it's really when you scale up and compare it to the standard of care that what tends to be practice changing. Um, so as I said, be cautious when inter interpreting preliminary data. And then finally, I'll just end with be careful of cross-study comparisons. Whatever your disease of interest is, we often are tempted to compare the results of study A with the results that per were presented two years ago with drug B. And you have to be cautious about that. I'm gonna show you one comparison. This is from the neuroendocrine world. Um, and the reason why it's telling is these are two studies, um, Clarinet and, and Radiant 4. They both are in similar populations. They're patients with non-functional tumors being treated with a drug versus placebo. The details don't matter that much, but these are curves looking at time to progression. So everybody starts out, they get enrolled on study, and then we look to see how long it takes for their disease to progress. And um, this is a positive study. You can see that the lanreotide patients, it took longer for them to have their, drug prog their disease progress compared to placebo. And this is, the, the colors are flip-flop, but same thing, also a positive study with everolimus. It took longer to progress than with placebo. But I wanna point out the placebo groups here. This group, the time to progression, the median time to progression was about four months. So by CT scans, it took about four months to show the tumor growth. In the, in the other group, it was 18 months. So the point being, this group of patients had much more stable disease going on study than this group of patients. The other way to look at it is these people had more aggressive disease. And there was a reason for this. It happened to be the way this study was designed. They actually required a couple of CT scans up front before patients went on study. And they ended up selecting for patients with very slow growing disease. But the point is, you have to be cautious about the comparing the data from the two different studies. Because in the end, they're both positive studies. Both drugs are approved. But they actually, when you look at the nitty gritty, the patients enrolled on these studies were actually somewhat different. Um, it doesn't take away from the efficacy it just, I'm pointing out, you have to be careful about directly comparing the results from study A to study B for that reason. Um, so to finish up, um, clinical trials are the very, very important vehicle for getting new drugs um, to our patients. Um, they can also lead to changes in practice, you know, incorporation of diet and ex exercise or screening modalities or uh, all, anything we do is often um, to, to improve the care of our patients often emanates from our clinical trials. Um, it's highly regulated to ensure that it's safe, but the decision to enroll in clinical trials depends on a lot of factors, and 
At the end of the day, it ultimately usually ends up being a discussion between the provider, the investigator, and the patient to see whether that is a good fit. Um, and then interpretation of clinical trials data requires a very careful understanding of the trial design, the population under study, and the overall treatment landscape for the disease. So with that, I'll finish. Um, thank you very much. We have a couple minutes. Do we have any questions for Dr. Burke? That's a really, yeah, the, the question was having two cancers. That goes into patient's medical history, and unfortunately, that is often an exclusion. And the reason is um, that when you're interpreting at least efficacy data, if you're trying to monitor cancers, it can be very confusing if a patient has a second active cancer in place. And so most studies, we actually think hard, long and hard about the exclusion. We try to exclude patients who have had a history of a cancer. We try to allow them to participate if their cancer has been cured or if it's a very small cancer like a basal cell skin cancer or something like that. But unfortunately, you're right. Um, and there are a fair number of patients who have, are living with two cancers or one recent cancer and one active cancer. And those patients are, in fact, often excluded from enrollment. Well, I'd really like to thank this morning Dr. Phelps, Dr. Fahey, and Dr. Berglund for the really great information. And again, make sure, please, when you leave here, that you provide us with your email address so we can send you the link to the presentations.